and her most recent Vibrant Matter, A Political Ecology of Things. She's also the co-editor of a couple of books and the author of far too many essays to mention. It makes you feel bad for the trees. <laughs> the second thing uh, I will mention is a geographical space. She is a professor of political science at Johns Hopkins. And one of the things that I have found very useful and interesting in her work is the way in which she encourages us to attend to the specific nature of places, spaces, and things. Uh, the fact that she is in Baltimore, the fact that she has moved around mostly the East Coast for most of her life, is a nice reminder of the located nature of her thought and of the work that she's done. Um, the last thing I want to mention is, uh, has to do with the new title of her paper. You might have noticed that there's an uh, addendum to your program. Um, and that is, there's a way, and I'd like to mention, I guess, a glove. That is, I suspect that some people are hoping that Jane Bennett will be throwing down a gauntlet <laughs> regarding the differences between her version of vital materialism and what Richard just mentioned as object-oriented ontology. I mentioned the glove there that's involved there to remind us of the things that lie beneath our metaphors that, that, that are not just symbolic meanings, they're not just historical events, they are not just metaphors. That is, they have kinds of materiality to them. And those materialities, those thingnesses, those ontologies, those heicities remain in our language, in our existence, long after we've even forgotten that they were there in the first place. So please join me in welcoming Jane Bennett. Thank you, Ken. Um, thanks also to Richard for inviting me. And especially thanks to Richard for his earlier remarks for including Thoreau in, as an early viewer in the um, sauntering non-human turn. I like that. I'm really glad to be here. <clears throat> OK. Systems and things. It's the name of a uh, grad seminar I taught last semester, fairly grandiose. Um, and um, the first section of my talk is called The Call of Things. Okay, the subtitle of the talk is Materialist and an Object-Oriented Philosopher Walk into a Bar, which is a subtitle I stole from an undergraduate paper. <laughs> um, okay, The Call of Things. Kant claimed it was impossible even to think of matter as animate. The very idea of a lively matter, he said, involves a contradiction, since the essential character of matter is lifelessness, inertia, end quote. But Kant underestimated the thinkable, and he overrated the squelching capacity of the contradictory, for there exists a rich philosophical tradition in the West of engaging materiality, animals, vegetables, minerals, as lively intensity as vital force. There is, for example, a Spinoza's notion of that every body, person, fly, stone, comes with a conatus or impetus to seek alliances that enhance its vitality. Or Diderot's depiction of the cosmos as a spider web of vibrating threads. Okay. Or Henry Thoreau's courtings of a wildness rumbling inside all earthly bodies or Lucretius's physics of primordia that swerve and simulacra that float and collide, <clears throat> which Michel Serre has spun into um, an ontology of fluctuating ado or noise. 
I wrote a book called Vibrant Matter that positioned itself within this tradition, a book that was quite literally a reply to a call from some lively matter that had temporarily congealed into things. In particular, some items of trash had collected in the gutter on a street in Baltimore, one large black work glove, one dense mat of oak pollen, one unblemished dead rat, one white plastic bottle cap, one smooth stick of wood, and one day, as I walked by, they called me over to them, and I stood enchanted by the tableau, tableau they formed, and for a few hyper-real moments, I saw, from the inside out, so to speak, how I, too, was an element in an assemblage that included these formerly sullen objects which were now expressive actants, to use Latour's term. I say all this now because I want to establish my or object-oriented credentials. Now, one way to describe the uncanny task that I and others in a broad and widening swath of disciplines are pursuing is to see what happens to our writings, our somatic movement styles, our sympathies and antipathies, our research designs, our consumption practices, and our very notion of what it means to be classified as human, if this call from things, or objects if you like, taken seriously, taken that is, as more than a figure of speech, more than a projection of voice onto some inanimate stuff, more than an instance of the pathetic fallacy. What if we admitted that things really do or can hail us, can participate in transmissions across bodies, um, and what, or what Brian Masumi last night called non-local liaisons? and offer us a glimpse into a world of swarming, lively materials that are neither quite subjects nor objects. Now, just how these transmissions work is a fascinating question, which requires, I think, a stretching, even a de deformation of phenomenology, even the best fleshy version of Merleau-Ponty, by adding some neuropsychology, some updated versions of Renaissance and Romantic notions of a sympathetic causality. On this latter point, I found inspiration in Walt Whitman's listing, both in the sense of a serial cataloging and in the sense of how his poems enact the listing or leaning toward or that preferentiality that one material composition naturally has for a set of others. But the how of non-human agency is a topic for another talk. And I'm glad I decided not to talk about um, sympathy. Couldn't really follow Brian's talk. That would be too horrid. Um, today, I want to focus on one of the internal differences within the big umbrella of the non-human turn. Crudely put, it's the difference between its Heideggerian and Deleuzian streams. This is one difference. Now, Heidegger considered the uncanny agency of things in several of his late essays, where the incalculability of the thing and its persistent withdrawal are emphasized. Many earthier eco-materialists, I consider myself one, lean more towards Deleuze and Guattari than Heidegger and emphasize the active power of things to draw other bodies near and enter into assemblages. Object-oriented ontologists, and I'm going to restrict my remarks here today to only two of them, Graham Harmon and our own Tim Morton, they're strongly attracted to Heidegger's focus on the thing's persistent withdrawal from any attempt to engage, use, or know it. And here's a good picture of the withdrawn object. Indeed, objects could not hope for more staunch defenders than Harmon and Morton, who include in the category object pretty much everything, human individuals, literary texts, alcohol, spoons, plants. An object is, says Morton, quote, a weird entity withdrawn from access, yet somehow manifest, end quote. Withdrawn and manifest, withdrawn. Even as my glove, rat, cap, stick thing was having its impact, its arresting effect on the me thing, the speculative realist, who eschews the label materialist, insists that none of the bodies at the scene were wholly present to one another. Withdrawn. Objects exist, says Harmon, as entities quite apart from any relations with or effects upon other entities in the world. But also manifest. Because despite this apartness, objects are coy, always leaving hints of a secret other world, alluding, that's Graham's word, to an inscrutable reality, quote, behind the accessible theoretical, practical, or perceptual qualities. Objects are expert players of the game of hide and seek, playing, no doubt, <coughs> with what Aaron Manning characterized last night as uncanny synchronicity, which carries them into the more than of the event. Um, again, in my talk today, I'm going to consider the figure of the object that Morton and Harmon affirm, 
focusing on the way it's positioned as a repudiation of holism. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what that could mean, what, what holisms might mean today. They include in that latter category assemblage theories, wherein bits and pieces of Deleuze, Latour, Uxkill, Manning, Haraway, Deland, and Masumi, Shaviro, echo philosophers like Barry Lopez and Val Plumwood, Whitehead, Spinoza, Foucault, and even Heidegger circulate. I'm also going to try to make explicit just what turns politically and ethically on object-oriented philosophers' strong claims about the apartness of objects. What difference would it make if I came to experience myself as more explicitly as one essentially elusive object among others? What is at stake for social life in North America, in its public culture as it intersects with elsewheres, for the fight against systems or process theories, especially since all the parties share a critique of linguistic and social constructivisms. Since that is, all parties see the non-human turn as a response to an overconfidence about human power that was inadvertently embedded in the postmodernisms of the 1980s and 1990s. Okay. Next section is called relationality. Um, at the heart of object-oriented ontology, says Harmon, is a, quote, deeply non-relational conception of the reality of things. But why such a deep animosity towards relational ontologies? One minor motive, one minor motive may be the pleasure of iconoclasm. For Harmon and, motive, uh, for Harmon and Morton, quote, networks, negotiations, relations, interactions, and dynamic fluctuations are considered as kind of golden calves. And it's enjoyable to smash idols. Who doesn't like that? Systems-oriented theory has, they say, already had its day and no longer yields philosophically interesting pro problems. Harmon says, quote, the programmatic movement towards holistic interaction is an idea once but no longer liberating. The real discoveries now lie on the other side of the yard, end quote. But the stakes are higher, too, I think, for them. In Aesthetics as First Philosophy, an essay by Harmon, Harmon implies that there are ethical, political, as well as philosophical liabilities to a relational or network or open systems or umwelt approach. A vision of holistic interactions in a reciprocal web, this blurring of boundaries between one thing and another, has held the moral high ground for too long, in philosophy for too long. The political reflexes associated with terms such as essence, bad, and reciprocal interplay good must be recalibrated. And in a forthcoming essay in New Literary History, Harmon goes so far as to call it a prejudice to approach the world in terms of, quote, complex feedback networks rather than integers. Now, I'm not sure what the alternative to a prejudice here would be. It could be something like reason judgment, in which case the claim would be that object-oriented philosophy is more rationally defensible, a kind of newbie perspective, less encrusted with unthinking habit, mainstream culture, or normal subjectivity than relation-oriented theory has become. <laughs> Or it may be that Harmon would acknowledge that object-oriented philosophy itself includes a prejudice in favor of a theoretical privileging or conceptual honing in on the mysterious object. But what this would then call for is an explicit count of the virtues or stakes of favoring mysterious objects over complex systems of relations, virtual and actual. Or maybe there's no need to choose between objects and their relations. Since everyday earthly experience routinely identifies some effects as coming from individualized objects and some from larger systems, capitalism, et cetera, or better put, from individuations within material configurations and from the complex assemblages in which they participate, why not aim for a theory that toggles between kinds or both kinds or magnitudes of unit of analysis? One would then understand objects to be those swirls of matter, energy, and incipients that can hold themselves together long enough to vie with the strivings of other objects, including the, interact, the, including the indeterminate momentum of the throbbing whole. The project, then, would be to make both objects and relations the periodic focus of one's theoretical attention, even if it is impossible to articulate fully the vague or vagabond essence of any system or thing, and even if it is impossible to give equal attention to both at once. Now this is, I think, just what those passé philosophers Deleuze and Guattari do in A Thousand Plateaus. That's my best line. Um, 
one of their figures for what I'm calling the system dimension of assemb is assemblage, another is plane of consistency. The latter is characterized by Deleuze and Guattari as, quote, in no way an undifferentiated aggregate of unformed matter. So no blob ontology. So um, neither assemblage nor plane of consistency qualifies as what Harmon was described as, quote, a relational wildfire in which all individual elements are consumed, end quote. My po po point, in short, is that despite their robust, robust attempts to conceptualize groupings, Deleuze and Guattari also managed to attend carefully to many specific objects, horses, shoes, orchids, packs of wolves, wasps, priests, metals, etc. Indeed, I find nothing in their approach inconsistent with the object-oriented philosopher's claim that things harbor, it's a very good claim, things harbor a differential between their inside and outside or an irreducible moment of withdrawn from view interiority. The example of a thousand plateaus also highlights the obvious point that not all theories of relationality, even if monistic, are holistic in the sense of a harmonious organism. There are, there are harmonious organisms, holisms, and I myself have a tendency to be attracted to them, although I'm ashamed of it, um, but also fractious models of systematicity, which allow for heterogeneity within and even emergent novelty, um, in even emergent novelty. These are onto pictures that are formally monistic but substantively plural. The whole, then, can be imagined as a self-diversifying process of territorializations and deterritorializations, that's Deleuze and Guattari, roughly, or as a creative process, Bergson, Whitehead, or as some combination therein, and I think the various new materialisms fit there. Or take the model of relationality that William Connolly, following William James, calls protean connectionism. In contrast to both methodological individualism and organic holism, Connectionism, he writes, figures relations as, quote, typically loose, incomplete, and themselves susceptible to potential change. The connections are punctuated by litter, circulating in between and around them. Viewed temporally, connectionism presents a world in the making in an evolving universe that's open to an uncertain degree, end quote. That was common. I find such attempts to do justice both to systems and to things to acknowledge the stubborn reality of individuations and the essentially distributive quality of their effectivity and affectivity, their capacity to produce effects, to remain philosophically and especially politically productive. For consumerist culture still needs reminding of the fragile, fractious interconnectedness of earthly bodies. I think it's important today for ecological and commodity chain reasons and economic, for, for these, I think it's important today for ecological reasons, commodity chain reasons, um, economic justice reasons, to foreground the material connections between human and non-human bodies and flows. Important, that is, not to throw the monistic baby out with the harmonious, holist bathwater. Now, Harmon rejects the very framing of the issue as things operating in systems in favor of an object-oriented picture in which aloof objects are positioned as the real and perhaps sole locus of all the acti activityizing. On occasion, however, even Harmon, against his object prejudice, finds himself theorizing a kind of relation. He calls it communication between objects. Now he, tries to ins now he does try to insulate this object-to-object -object encounter from depictions that also locate activity in the relationships themselves or at the systemic level of operation. But I do not think that this parsing attempt succeeds. And to be honest, I don't quite see why it is worth the trouble, though it does bespeak the purity of Harmon's commitment to the aloof object. I think I might be, oh, okay, well, this is coming up. Um, Harmon writes, the real problem is not how beings interact in a system. Instead, the real problem is how they withdraw from that system as independent realities while somehow communicating through the proximity, the touching without touching, that has been termed illusion or allure. Now, I concur that some dimensions of body things are withdrawn from presence, but see this as partly due to the role they play in this or that relatively open system. Now, in the text I just quoted, Harmon goes on to defend the view that communication via proximity is not limited to that between human bodies. And I like that idea. Tim Morton makes a similar anti-anthropocentric 
uh, gesture when he says, and this is the thing on the screen, um, what spoons do when they scoop up soup is not very different from what I do when I talk about spoons, not because the spoon is alive or intelligent, and I guess Steve Shabir, I'm looking forward to his talk on that, about panpsychism, but because appearances, etc. Now by engaging in what, because, <laughs> etc. I always wonder whether it's redundant to read what's up on the screen. You can read there. Okay. Um, by engaging in what Bruno Latour might call a horizontalizing of the ontological plane, Morton and Harmon allow their ecological sympathies to come to the fore. And this is obvious in Tim's case, less obvious in Harmon's case, um, because Harmon mm, is is it kind of has an anxious philosopher's insistence that one include objects of thought in the category objects. Um, in the following quotation, however, um, Harmon, Harmon does concern himself explicitly with earthy, ordinary, non-ideationing objects. He writes, if it is true that other humans signal to me without being fully present, and equally true that I never exhaust the depths of non-sentient beings such as apples and sandpaper, this is not some special pathos of human finitude. When avalanches slam into abandoned cars, or snowflakes rustle the needles of the quivering pine, even these objects cannot touch the full reality of one another, yet they affect one another, one another nonetheless. That's Harmon. The next section is called hyperobjects. Now Morton also agrees that process or assemblage are undesirable conceptualizations. He writes, objects are ontologically prior to relations, end quote. And he shares the judgment that attempts to juggle both system and thing are ultimately reductionist. That's also a quote. The reduction consists, I think, in the fact that for Deleuze et al., quote, some things are more real than others. Flowing liquids become the templates for everything else, end quote. And thus there is a failure to, says Tim, explain the givenness of the ontic phenomenon. Now, Morton succeeds in making me think twice about my own attraction to ontologies of becoming when he points out that they are biased towards the peculiar rhythms and scale of the human body. I also take his point about the human body-centric nature of the figure of a flowing liquids ontology. Here's Morton. I marvel at the way syrup lugubriously slimes its way out of a bottle. But to a hypothetical four-dimensional sentient being, such an event would be an unremarkable static object, while to a neutrino, the slow gobs of syrup are of no consequence whatsoever. There is no reason to elevate the lava lamp fluidity into the archetypical thing, end quote. Perhaps there is no reason to do so, if, that is, we are in fact capable of transcending the provincial pro-human conatus perspective from which we apprehend the world. That would be a post-humanist perspective. But a non-humanist perspective doesn't have to, not, it probably says that, or at least my non-humanist perspective doesn't think we can transcend the sort of human-centric conatus. You can, you can work around the edges, but you can't eliminate it. If we're not able to eliminate it, then a good tack might be to stretch and strain those modes to make room for the outlooks, rhythms, and trajectories of a greater number of actants to, that is, get a better sense of the operating systems upon which we rely. Now, Morton also offers a promatic political rationale for his devotion to the coy object. No model of the whole, flowing or otherwise, can today help us cope with what he elsewhere calls hyperobjects. And this is the part of his position that raises the strongest objection, I think, to even a fractious assemblage model. Hyperobjects, he writes, are phenomena such as radioactive materials and global warming. They are mind-blowing activities. I'm sorry, entities. Because their are human time scales and the extremely large or vastly diffused quality of their occupation of space unravels the very notion of entity. It also becomes hard to see how it is possible to think hyperobjects hyper by placing them within a larger whole within which hum we humans are a meaningful part, for hyperobjects render us kind of moot. For Morton, quote, this means that we need some other basis for making decisions about a future to which we have no real sense of connection, end quote. Evidence of the unthinkability of the hyperobject, 
called climate change, is the fact that conversations about it, says Morton, often devolve into the more conceptualizable and manageable topic of weather. Weather, even with its large theater of operation, remains susceptible to the probabilistic analyses of humans, and it can still be associated with the idea of a highly complex natural order. Weather, in short, is still an object. But with climate change, writes for Tim, it's much harder, impossible really, to sustain a sense of the existence of, quote, a neutral background against which human events can become meaningful. Climate change represents the possibility that cycles and repetitions we come to depend on for our sense of stability and place in the world may be the harbingers of cataclysmic change, end quote. I agree, but I also note that the terms mind-blowing and ahuman timescales imply that we can indeed stretch ourselves to study how climate systems might interact with the capitalist systems to threaten our future on Earth. Next section is called Modesty. In recent essays, Morton and Harmon focus their objection to relationism around the claim that, quote, Everything is connected is one of those methods that has long since entered its decadence and must be abandoned. That's, that's Harmon. Here again, we see that one of the reasons for the rejection of relationism is that it distracts attention from the non-connections between objects or their withdrawn nature. But what precisely are the ill effects that are feared? Harmon and Morton don't always say it outright, but I believe their target is human hubris. Their claim about the withdrawal of the object, uh, objects operates with the force of a litany, and I take this rhetorical tick to indicate something about the ethical impetus behind the position. Object-orientedness is what Foucault would have called a technique of self that seeks to counter the conceit of human reason and to chastise what Nietzsche might have called the will to truth. I, too, share the desire, as do many, many of us in the room, um, to cultivate theoretical modesty. But object-oriented philosophy has no monopoly on the means to this end. Contemporary materialisms inspired by Deleuze, Thoreau, Spinoza, Latour, neuroscience, many, many other sources that affirm a vitality or creative power of bodies and forces at all ranges or scales also can cut against the hubris of human exceptionalism. And I'm a bit perplexed by Morton's rejection of materiality as a term of art. He seems to recognize no version except that associated with matter as a flat, fixed, or law-like substrate. What is more, does not a focus on the sensuous stuff of earthy bodies save relationism from the hologram version that Harmon rightly criticizes? I find myself living in a world populated by material, diverse, lively stuff. In this materialism, things, that is special, the, uh, things, what is special about them, given their sensuous specificity, their particular material configuration, and their distinctive idiosyncratic history, matter a lot. But so do the eccentric assembly assemblages they form. Earthy bodies of various but also always finite durations affect and are affected by one another, and they form noisy systems or temporary working assemblages, which are, as much as any individuated thing, loci of effectivity and allure. These sometimes stubborn and voracious but never closed or sovereign systems enact real change. They give rise to new configurations, individuations, patterns of leanings and affections. Networks of things display differential degrees of creativity for good or ill from, the human point of, from a human point of view. I say this because Harmon argues that a philosophy such as mine which connects hiding and seeking objects to assemblies can have no account of change. This is because, the argument goes, there must be an unactualized surplus for something to happen. But systems as well as things can house an underdetermined surplus. What last night we heard talked about uh, by uh, uh, Masumi and um, Manning as a more than. And assemblage theories can offer an account of the emergence of novelty without also rendering the traje trajectory, impetus, drive, energetic push of any existing body epiphenomenal to its relations. Next section is called Objects, Things, Bodies. Harmon says that the distinction between objects and things is irrelevant for his purposes, perhaps because he does not want to just restrict himself unduly to the weird physicality of objects or to the power that they exhibit in relatively direct bodily encounters with us. 
I am more focused on this naturalist realm. And here I find the term thing or body better as a marker of individuation, better at highlighting the way certain edges within an assemblage tend to stand out to certain classes of bodies for certain activities. The smell and movement of the mammal to the tick to invoke Euxkill's famous example. Thing or body has advantages over object, I think, if one's task is to disrupt the political parsing that yields only active American manly subjects and passive objects. Why try to disrupt this parsing? Because we're daily confronted with evidence of non-human vitalities actively, actively a work around and within us. And I do so also because the frame of subjects and objects is unfriendly to the intensified ecological awareness that we need if we're to respond intelligently to signs of the breakdown of the Earth's carrying capacity for human life. I'm going to close with a short section called Texts as Special Bodies. These are tentative comment, comments about those things that are literary, using the essay and the poem as my examples. Like all bodies, these literary objects are affected by other bodies, or as Morton puts it, a poem is not simply a representation, but rather a non-human agent. I would also proclaim that the effectivity of a text body, including its ability to gesture toward a something more, is a function of a distributive network of bodies. Words on the page, words in the reader's imagination, words, sounds of words, sounds and smells in the reading room, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all these bodies co-acting are what do the job. There are also, it seems to me, however, some features of the text body that are not shared or are shared differentially by bodies that rely more heavily on smell and touch and less heavily on the conveyances that are words. Now, I'm not qualified to say too much about the effectivity of a text um, since I'm not a literary theorist, um, but I pretend to be. Um, uh, so I'm not qualified to say too much about the affectivity of a text as a material body, and I'm only going to gesture in the direction of what Walt Whitman takes, the dress gesture that he takes, when he says that poetry, if it's enmeshed in a fortuitous assemblage of other non-text bodies, can have material effects as real as any. If, he says, you read the leaves of grass in conjunction with the open air every season of every year of your life, and also while bound in affection to the earth and sun and the animals, while also going freely with powerful, uneducated persons and with the young and with the mothers of families, then your very flesh is going to, shall be a great poem and have the richest fluency, not only in its words, but in the silent lines of its lips and face and between the lashes of your eyes and in every motion and joint of your body. So, texts we can think of as bodies that can light up by rendering human perception more, ac more acute those other bodies whose favored vehicle of affectivity is less wordy, such as, the, the, such as plants, animals, blades of grass, household objects, trash. Another example of uh, this passage, yeah, another example is this passage from Finnegan's Wake, where Joyce describes Shem the hoarder's living space. The warped flooring of the lair and sound conducting walls thereof, to say nothing of the uprights and imposts, were Persianly littered with burst love letters, telltale stories, sticky back snaps, doubtful eggshells, bouchers, flints, borers, puffers, amygdaloid almonds, rindless raisins, alphabetiform verbiage, biblical viases, am ampiter dictas, visus ombique, ahems and ahas, ineffable tries at speech unassyllabled, uomies, Eold hymns, flu flow smut, fallen lucifers, vestures which had, vestures which had served, showered ornaments, borrowed brogues, reversible jackets, black eye lenses, family jars, false hair shirts, godforsaken scapulars, never worn breeches, cutthroat ties, counterfeit frames, vexed intentions, curried notes, upset Latin tin tacks, unused mill and stumpling stones, twisted quills, painful digests, magnifying wine glasses solid objects cast at goblins, once current puns, <laughs> quashed potatoes, messes of motage. So I'm just going to end by saying, perhaps the most important stake for me of the non-human turn is how it might help us to live more sustainably with less violence towards a wider variety of bodies. And poetry can help us feel more of the liveliness hidden in such things and reveal more of the threads of connection binding our fate to theirs. Thanks.
wonderful talk. And um, I enjoyed your ending, your move toward the literary. And I just have a, a small comment about uh, your reading of the passage from Finnegan's Wake. Uh-oh. Uh, it was a wonderful <laughs> reading, but you actually misread, in a wonderfully symptomatic way, the word literature as littered. And I think yeah. that that slip is, in fact, very much what your talk is about, which is about the literature of litter, litter as literature, and literature as litter. So I just wanted to tell you you've done that. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. <laughs> That, I really enjoyed this talk too. Thank you. I, I wanted to, this isn't partly just for sheer education here, I, I uh, wanted to know what your take on this exchange or the Harmon's reading of Latour. Partly because I was, I hadn't read, read it in full, but one of the things I was taking from it was more concessions to uh, relationism than it sounded like here. And I wondered if you sort of saw that as genuine or the, the part that I started to lose to my mind and at the end was actually where that all gets under or something like that. <clears throat> you know, I'm not an expert on, on, on his work. I read the, the, the book on Latour, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I really, I think that he does give a little more to relationism there. I I think what I wanted to do today was sort of just open up a discussion to thinking about new ways of figuring <coughs> what used to be thought of as a holism or an inter interconnectionism. And that, um, and to think about ways to have a, a monism that is formally one, one but substantively many, and that can encounter things and Connections. So that's really what I'm interested in, and I've put, I've given the kind of hardcore object side of Harmon in order to try to set up, set up that that thinking, right? Um, so I guess I'm probably just going to punt on the questions of what of, of what you know, Graham thinks. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Not through symbology, except for sort of a kind of parallel yeah. experience based on shared history. And for me, as a rhetoric person, that's an astonishing moment to realize that I don't communicate or I don't have access to another person's reality through language, but possibly through instinct, and that there's sort of the illusion, the cold current. So when you so when you so when you hear this stuff about withdrawn, you hear that at an epistemological re register exclusively. Because when I read it, I think, well, but there's all sorts of ways of like the, I, I would emphasize the manifest or the presencing as well as the withdrawing. I mean, the withdrawing at the epistemological level, yes, but then there's these flows of sympathy, intuition, all this other stuff that. The, the focus on the withdrawal of objects, it, 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 I, I think it's over overstated because it's because it gives a lot of privilege to the fact that I mean it acts as though people always already relate to things primarily epistemologically or through knowledge claims, but that's that's not even true. Right? So so for me so that 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 just sounds to me overstated. But you hear it. You hear it more as a pro-intuition claim. I think for me, it foregrounds the fact that you don't have access to any other reality because you want through language, through language, through material, through conventional material technology, which I think. So it's not about privilege one or the other. For me, it's just putting 
Masumi's talk did focus on that. Uh, I focus a little bit more on the every everyday encounters at the at, after the emergence. Yeah. So relation really means a connection between the defined things. I'm focusing on that, but it's not exclusively that. Okay. I, yeah. I think both are present all the time. The you know the actual and the the virtual incipiencies in there. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and I'm really curious to ask you a little bit about a section in that book, if that's okay. Sure. Um, you, you brought up uh, Francois Julian's Tensi uh, of Things. And yeah. You about shit in there. And uh, I have a background uh, when I was an undergraduate. Uh, I studied uh, classical East Asian philosophies. And it was so exciting to have that perspective come into this conversation because it seems to me that um, that classical Chinese, specifically like the classical Chinese, yes. Very much um, having this conversation, and I, I, I'll just love to learn more about how you came into that, and where you think uh, do you think that that's a second uh, place to go. And yeah. Can continue to talk about uh, totally other orientation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I you know I, I teach political theory in the sort of Western Civ mode, um, and I came to Francois Julien's piece through an odd root, which was Machiavelli's notion of fortuna, because um, the relationship between for fortuna and vertu, and like the virtuous prince has to be able to read the scene that, of fortuna with all of its contingencies and, um, and has to be able to cultivate an attentiveness to a, to a kind of systems and things indeterminate, an indeterminate uh, systems and things force. And then I started thinking about Fortuna in that way, and then someone suggested the the propensity of things. From, from, but that's that's pretty much the end of my non-Western thing. So I would be happy to learn more about that. Yeah. If I may, uh, Roger Ames uh, and Leah uh, Paul have a book called Focusing the Familiar, and it's a philosophical translation of a classical text called The Zhongyong. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's all about how novelty can be taught. How do you teach someone to be creative? This kind of mm -hmm. absurd proposition. Mm -hmm. Because you, you already know everything and then nothing changes. Yeah. Yeah, well, that sounds very much like the prince because that's a, that's how you can teach how you can cultivate yourself to be a, a good reader of the wave or of the fortuna. Yeah. Not you can never succeed perfectly because sometimes it's a you know a over overpowering natural force. But yeah. Thank you. Yes. So um, it, it seemed like from what you were saying that there was a, a, a more than fan implication uh, that certain aspects of object-oriented ontology um, might be politically dubious due to their uh, sort of focus on on individual cells. Um, and I I just wanted to like throw something else out there and uh, you know maybe preface that statement with the comment that I'm I'm a huge fan of Whitehead and I'm a huge fan of your work as well um, and I'm also a huge, hugely drawn to object-oriented ontology and I think it might be useful to sort of 
start thinking about ways in which they can be made to, to work together. And one, one thought that I have is that the thesis of withdrawal doesn't just pertain to human-sized objects. It, you know, in Tim's work, it also pertains to huge objects, and those objects sometimes contain us, too, like social systems uh, contain human beings, and they right. are themselves objects possessed of a certain level of uh, agency and force. And it, it seems to me that there might be a way there of working out a tension that has prevailed on the left for a long time. You know, in sort of pu pushing back against this notion that object-oriented ontology is inherently conservative, neoliberal, even like fascist, as some people have claimed. Well, I don't think that was No, no, yeah. I'm not saying you're saying that. That's good, you know, blogosphere, but that, that sort of... <laughs> <laughs> um, it, the, the, you know, on the 20th century left, and going back to the 19th century, you had a tension between anarchist and uh, sort of socialist ideas. And the anarchists were sort of about like defending individuals uh, to a certain extent as uh, irreducibly real things in the face of large systems that encompass them. And socialists were about creating sort of macro systems that were, um, you know, an expression of a sort of collective will. And I think within object-oriented ecology, there's a way of thinking about doing both of those things because both levels of scale are equally real. You can have a sort of defense of an irreducibly real human individual, but you can also talk about the creation of, of collectivities that are also irreducibly real. And uh, you know, just one other comment: I don't think that there's a, a complete antipathy to intimacy in, in the ill side of things. That, you know, withdrawal happens, but relations do happen too. And every time a relation happens, it produces a new object. So there could be like intimacy objects that are sort of close around. Just yeah. Maybe. I guess I think there's an effectivity of relations that is not tieable to objects. And I guess I'm influenced by Latour, one, something that Latour said about the slight surprise of action, that when, when an assemblage forms, and objects appear. There's incipiencies as well, but then there's activities, and then the out, the effect, effectivity, the outcome, is there can be a slight surprise that's uh, possessed by the action, or is a function of the action. Yeah. But I, but I agree with you that the question of the political. I mean, every theory can have multiple ethical and political implications. It depends on how. You know, it depends on what other assemblages they get caught up in and, and get developed. Um, and I, I guess my critique, if I have one, or the one, one criticism, or it's not even a criticism, it's more like an aesthetic lack of attraction to object-oriented ontology. It has to do with, um, has to do with a kind of um, ecological, maybe 1970s influenced um, imaginary, um, a kind of whole earth thing that don't want to throw that whole thing out, I just want to renovate it pretty seriously. And it also has to do with, um, hmm, I forgot my second point now, but <laughs> those are good points that we can keep 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 talking about. Yeah, Jane, yeah. I, I've got a question on Twitter, from Twitter. Okay. From Ian Bogos. <laughs> <laughs> He's right there? Yeah, that, yeah right there. Uh, Ian says that Bennett asks how the non-human turn might help us live more sustainably, and this follows from the question of how it's yeah. good, but how do we decide what gets to be sustained? Okay, and I just remembered my other um, point. Yeah, um, if I have a criticism, do they not do that? If I have a criticism about object-oriented ontology, it's just or an aesthetic lack of preference. It's be, it's 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 something that philosophers. It's a it's a philosopher more philosopher way of thinking, which is good and interesting. I just don't have that way. Mine is a little bit different. So it's it's just kind of it grows out of the discipline of philosophy. Yeah. Um, okay, what, what is sustainable? I know, I know that's really fraught because like do we want to sustain the earth for us as it is in the rich west and only for humans and what about, um, what about a world without us that would be sustainable and life in the earth is going to be, yeah, all, is that all the questions, Ian? That sort of stuff, yeah. Um, 
Do you want to speak to that? No? Okay. Um, <laughs> in the medium and short run, we've got to we've got to tread more lightly on resource consumption. We've got to tread more lightly on the earth. Otherwise, well, it's already vastly unjust what we're doing to other people. And in the short run, I would like to inculcate a uh, small footprint kind of thing. And so when I talk about sustainability, I guess I'm thinking um, for humans and uh, ecological diversity, but for humans reconfigured and re-experienced as themselves having a lot of its inside of them, a lot of non-humans inside of them. So a human that's no, that a human really profoundly understood as a multi-species, multi-species, multi-mattered creature. And so maybe there's some future in which this configuration of the human will mush out into um, something else. And I could imagine that happening. So it's not like I want to, you know, freeze the human as, you know, as it's materially configured right now, because we are already many more things than, than humans. And so, so I want to work at sort of two fronts. One, in an everyday experience, understand ourselves as worms and plastic and metal and this and that, you know, all in there. And then at the other front, while we're, you know, human in this form, try to do less violence, try to use less stuff, try to, you know, be gentler. That's what I mean by sustainability, for a start. It's not really a good answer. Yeah. I just want to lob something Yeah. Dandelions, and there's a, a story floating around on social media that um, every human tested has a certain amount of Roundup in their yes in their bodies. So yes, this, I mean this kind of speaks to this decision: do we choose to eliminate all dandelions, or do we choose to accept the, uh, that we are part Roundup? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean. That, yeah, and, and the other point I want to make is that I still think, when I talked about like the conatus-driven human body, I still think this, there's a version of like self-interest that I don't repudiate. I think that this ecological sensibility should incorporate a version of like the conative drive to persevere in your, in your existence and form assemblages with other bodies that can enhance your power. I think that's a good account. And um, so do we want to form an assemblage with Roundup with the effects that that produces? Or do we want to form an assemblage with lawns that have a lot of dandelions in them? Yeah, and that kind of thing. Dandelions themselves. And dandelions and themselves. Lawns. Forget the lawns, yeah. Or include the lawns yeah. in the dandelions. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I was, I, as a poet, I was really interested, especially in that turn you took, well, turn, in that movie you made at the end. Um, when you write Finnegan's Weight and talked about how poetry can make us feel more intensely. Um, yeah. And that this could um, yield sort of a sense of political justice, perhaps. But you made the turn really quickly. And yeah. Then, and I was, I was trying to write that. Could you explain a little bit more about what you're thinking? Is that yeah. I mean, I, I wanted, like, what one of the things that I take from the object-oriented philosophers is the um, broad, uh, cat the, how, how capacious the category of the object is, including in literary text. And in, in like the vibrant matter thing, I sort of did this thought experiment where, where I was like really anti-language. If it has language in it, I'll just parse, you know, put that aside. Or if it has human subjectivity, I won't pay attention. Now I want to try to, through reading the, the, the object-oriented ontologist, I wanted to put back, try to think about the peculiar kind of thing that a text is, right? Like in particular a poem. And, and I was thinking, what kind, of, what kind of agency does that configuration of material bits have? Are there distinctive effects that go with the text body as opposed to the plant body, say. And one of the things that I thought the text body has the capacity to do, or at least for a starting point, it's an, uh, something quite obvious, is that if you read poetry or you read certain configuration of words, your sensibility changes and then you're able to detect, like your radar for detection gets uh, honed or, or tuned in a different direction. And so you read Leaves of Grass 
and you go out, you know, Whitman sleep grass, and then you go out there, and then you can't, you can't, you can't step on grass in the same way because it's, you know, the uncut hair of graves, you know, as he says. So, so that that was the idea. So it really has to do with a text reattunes my eyes at this physical level. Yeah. And why poetry not stories? Mm, well, this way yeah, yeah. 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 It's just that poetry really brings to the fore more the sound quality of words and and the you know it's read aloud, etc. Yeah. Yes. The object, which is the book, is under attack? The book, yeah. As a no. Um, but, but tell me a bit more what, what you're thinking. You mean like as opposed to digitized stuff? And, yeah. yeah. Um, um, no, because there's materiality of the digital book. I, I, I don't I, no, I, I don't think that the book is under attack. Um, I think the book has morphed. And, and is is morphed and changed, evolved. Yeah. Yes. I had a question about, about um, the, the role of the uh, inhuman in thinking about uh, uh, the non-human. Because it seems to me that uh, often when we talk about objects healing us, but right, it's taking place in a world that's already been domesticated. Yep. Right. So that you know, so that within that kind of, of um, life world, where nature lacks the capacity to terrify us. Associated with any kind of um, hostility, right? And we're in this uh, disproportionate position of power, you know, over the environment, or at least that seems to be a presumption. Uh, and it seems to me that, um, that, that you know, the inhuman, in a sense, um, I don't know, is there a certain political value, perhaps, to rehabilitating it, given that um, if we look at examples of ecologically sustainable society throughout history, I mean, they involve a fair amount of, of very brutal uh, coercion, right, and rigid class hierarchy. I mean, it's basically preventing people from uh, advancing beyond their position, right, for the sake of preserving um, the environment. So, um, so, you know, so what is the relationship, you know, for you between the, say, the non-human and the, and the inhuman, right, which um, contains this um, vital, you know, historical, and certainly politically very uh, challenging uh, component? Hmm. Um. I don't think I understand. You're going to have to come. I'll, I'll say a few things, maybe you can come back to me, because I, I think there's a couple things in what you say. For, to start, I don't think any world is ever fully domesticated by humans. I mean, even if you're walking down the street, there's the capacity to be terrified and overwhelmed by uh, poisons, uh, et, et cetera. So, so I guess we, we might have a different understanding of the the, the, the the urban or the, but I don't think that's what's behind your, do you think that I, well, say your point again about the relationship between the non-human and the inhuman. You mean the inhuman forces of nature like a tidal wave or a, or a, or a, or a, or a HIV virus and And you endorse that view? You think nature lacks the ability to, to, to terrify us in any meaningful way? Well, I think um, in the, the first world, industrial society, I think that element is, is, is perhaps uh, uh, the vital difference, I think, between the first world and the third world. Mm, I don't think so. I think nature still has the capacity to, ter to terrify us. Although it's never a pure nature, it's always a, a, an admixture. No, we don't, though. Do we? 
<laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't think so either. I mean, I think there's there's great spectacles of human death and. Dark matter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think so. There's a well. I think Japan has uh, an amazing uh, example of credentialists. And I mean, they they are the first post-apocalyptic human society that we're aware of. Like atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and of course in Arizona, and I've heard New Mexico, well, it's just, but like as a people and a culture, is having that conversation about the work we do when humanity becomes inhuman. What do we do on an island that um, is constantly uh, short on, on natural resources for food production, uh, and constantly at the mercy of massive meteorological events and seismic events? I think that uh, that, that uh, there are great folks to look to for models of how we might be. Um, and again, there's not that presupposition of nature as something I'm not. Um, nature is I am that I am round up and talk about the non-human term, human beings, they're set in terms of cells, we're mostly bacteria. We're like one-tenth of the animal cells that we call human. I'm sorry. No, that's, that's good. <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> this is a far less practical uh, question, but I was wondering, if you talked about fractured systems, a fractured system? Yeah. And the question I had was, in terms of the other way, or, or no, that's right, formally one, Formal substantively one. many. Yes. Yeah. Right. And I was curious um, how that relates to your sort of stretching, trying to talk about stretching the human and stretching um, the phenomenological model, and how that relates to that. Is the formal one a result of that phenomenological stretching, mm-hmm. or does that formal one be more of an epistemological um, okay. operation, and then sort of the heterogeneity comes from the phenomenological, you know, trying to apply us? Yeah, there I'm primarily Spinozist um, in in the idea of a single substance um, that manifests multiply and manifests in ways that are some ways it doesn't manifest to us at all. Um, so. The, the backstory of that claim is a kind of Spinozist substance, which is some version of a substance I want to hold on to for the sake of this uh, 
we're all connected, all bodies are connected thing. Now, a lot of work has to be done on that notion and the Spinozist, um, the Spinozist thing about attributes, you know, the, the uh, it's not perfect, but um, that that's the back the background of it is some kind of some kind of sharedness that is the starting point, and then it, and, but but it becomes extremely messy and fractured. Yeah. I promised this was a less abstruse question the last time, but what I was. I said I'm not a philosopher. Remember well, that. Yeah, but I'm, I'm jumping that through. I was trying to follow up on the comment about poetry and how that changes our, you know, experience and the way we encounter you know, grass or whatever it might be. And I, w I guess my thought was, well, that that you know, scientific sorts of narratives can have the same yep. sorts of effects. And yes. I wonder if you know. You know, the comment was, so I wanted to get your perspective on what the possibilities might be for a rapprochement between science and some humanities on the basis of you know the power right. of scientific narratives to enable us to register differences. Right, that's a great question. I, I, I agree with that. I mean, um, in another talk that I gave, I used this short video um, that uses the vocabulary of cell biology, which is it's just as evocative and and sensory altering and the, the video is how um, different parts of the cell perform different functions it's a computer generated thing where and the, at one point the, the cell has this little sweeper machine that cleans up the, the bits of the, the cell and it's just like fantastic um, so yeah I, I mean I think science the scientific language is also poetic um, and and can have you know it's a little bit like whatever is Challenge, whatever, whatever's the wild, that's Thoreau's phrase. Whatever you encounter, that provokes the wild. And, and for me, sci the scientific vocabulary of cell biology does. If I was a cell biologist, it would have become normalized. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Hey, thanks so much for your talk. Um, and uh, with this audience or with other audiences, are you seeing any implications for, for our protocols for history, for, for doing historical inquiry, yeah. are you suggesting that we restage or we uh, we alter our own role in, say, history from the viewpoint of a mushroom or from what yeah. Are, yeah. What are you seeing? In yeah. In terms of Hist historical doing history, history yeah. Um, a model for me of an interesting way of doing history that takes this stuff into account. Um, well, to, to the short answer is multi, multi time, multi speeds and multi times. Here's my example. There's this, um, this, this collective have done this guidebook for New York City. Like it's a tourist little brochure thing and you go through it and um, it's called New York is a Geological Force. And it, so you go, you, you, you know, you take your kids, you go to the New York Public Library, look, but instead of just thinking about the content, the human contents of the books in the library, you think also about the stone, li the stone lines in the front. And then you, you, expand, you, you multiply the temporalities. How long does it take to build the building? How long did the stars take for it to produce the granite, the produced a stone, and so that there's a little, um, there's a geo, um, cultural, um, and then also micro level temporalities that are depicted there. So it, it's, so, so for me that's a start to, to, to change, it's still human perspectives because the one that's privileged is the time span of a creature that lives roughly 70 years with roughly our change of pace and capacity to change your thoughts. All that is, is got a kind of constraint of the limits uh, of the temporalities you can experience, but to, to write history in a way that um, has multiple levels of temporality that um, produce this effect, the New York Public Library with the stone things. And they did the same thing with the paint on the bright yellow of the taxi cabs. How, how did that come to be? What, would have, what kind of actancies had to be in place in order for that paint to emerge? Right. Yeah. So that's just a, that's a start. Yeah, I guess with things like mushrooms, I mean, I, restaging history about mushrooms, maybe some moments of deforestation mm -hmm. that do something for the history of mushrooms or right. toe exploding in a yeah. city, whatever. And, and it, right. it, it makes us as human agents more humble. Yes, and it makes you think deep, long time, as opposed to, sh and that's also politically very salient, I think. Instead of the small one-week time frame, you start thinking 
centuries, more than centuries, millennia, you know, global, uh, gl glacial time, yeah. Yeah, oh wait, I think we're done, but. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, your sister put it out. Yeah. So friends of the Pleistocene. Yeah, people wanted to find it online. It's called Friends of the Pleistocene and Smudge Studio. Smudge Studio, yes. All right, thank you. Just a hand for Jane Bennett.